185 cans. They're about 12 to 14 grams each. So if the math works out, that's... This is what I'm smelting. I smashed them in a pneumatic machine. For California Air Tools, right there, it's a 1P106SP or something. A very low power, very quiet air compressor. Pumps air through this hose assembly. This end here plugs into the adapter right here. That's the foot switch. When you press the foot switch, it jams, it jams this hydraulic rod into the can, smashes the cans, and then they come out the bottom. I had cast six bars successfully and was going for a seventh and probably need to do ten or so to finish all my cans, but I called it short because of this. Here I removed the crucible just as I did six times previously. Then I grab it with the tongs just to, oh shit, there's an accident. Damn it, now it runs down. Oh no, oh no. Well I had a minor mishap as you can see here and spilled this ceramic plate by uneven heating it with these bars here. Here's the production. These are aluminum pop and beer cans that have been melted down into ingot bars. Here's another look at the bars from the other side, flipped over. This is the top, that was the bottom the first time. This is an aluminum magnesium alloy. Since the lid on the pop can is made of a magnesium 
aluminum alloy known as, known as magnalium. The resulting bar has a small amount of magnesium and a little bit of carbon and silicon that can be re-refined once I turn them in as scrap. This is the propane forge that I use and you can see with the lines on the ground over here, it's still piping hot on the inside. Fortunately, the handle's not. Now we can see even more profound lines. The lid's kind of toasty too. That's the crucible I melt the aluminum in. This is known as a 10 pound propane metal forge. And this is my slag bucket. There's a lot of aluminum in there. I'll break that down and re-smelt it to extract some residual aluminum. That's the chair that I sit in as a folding metal chair. This is the burner tube that converts the propane connection from one of those burn zomatic propane tanks like that. It's a five gallon tank. It mixes with oxygen. The oxygen gets sucked in right here and then blows a searing hot flame out the end of that hole right there. Another look at the slag bucket. Bunch of um, ash from the labels, carbon from the plastic liner of the cans, oxides and other funk known as slag and smelting. I wear um, safety glasses at a minimum. I use thick leather gloves to protect my hands, although I managed to burn my finger. I don't know if you can see that right there on the edge and um, on the knuckle right there. They still hurt. These are my forge tools that are woefully inaccurate. And it was the use of this relatively robust tool right here that caused me to finger fumble and spill the aluminum on the brick, which then ran off and went into the asphalt driveway, producing that weird looking optical effect. I'd like to talk to you about aluminum, the metal. Aluminum is used in car wheels, reducing sprung weight, which improves performance. Everything that's lighter in the transaxle of a car makes it more efficient, gives it better performance. Aluminum is extensively used in aircraft. The 747, for example, the one that really got commercial aircraft going for passenger aircraft that's feasible and affordable for people like you and I, not just billionaires and the ultimate upper income earners, the elite and their friends. The Boeing 747 and different vehicles from other aerospace companies in Europe, for example, made passenger aircraft a commercial possibility. Now there are many airlines like Virgin, US Air, Alaska, that move people all around the world and that fuels globalization. You look at the airframe, with the exclusion of the mostly composite 787 from Boeing, nearly every commercial airline plane, every commercial aircraft, has been made out of aluminum alloys. They choose aluminum because it's very low mass or has a a low density and a high strength to weight ratio. It's not as good as titanium, but it's also 35 times less expensive. Now newer automobiles like the aluminum Ford F-150 are up to 600 pounds lighter than their steel alloy counterparts or contemporaries. So when an automaker makes the body shell of a modern automobile out of aluminum, like the Audi S8, they're shaving off 30 or 40% of the mass versus making it out of steel. And that results in much better performance, better braking, better handling, better acceleration, better fuel economy, lower emissions, all around better. In normal passenger vehicles like a Toyota or a Lexus, my two favorites because of their reliability and long-term durability, they typically make the alloy wheels out of a magnesium aluminum alloy. Most modern engine blocks are made out of an aluminum alloy, including the head, no, not the valves uh, or the valve springs. There are a mixture of steel alloys and, and aluminum alloys, and the body shell is a mixture of steel alloys. Aluminum is an amazing heat conductor, so in computers, aluminum finds applications as a heat sink. In air-cooled applications where a brushless motor fan blows air past the fin radiator. And what happens in fin radiators is there's more surface area, so the heat from the chip is conducted, it's thermal conductivity, into the aluminum, and then the aluminum radiates it as infrared and passively, and then the air moving through it steals the heat from the aluminum. Uh, a lot of automobile radiators are made out of aluminum for the same reason. So as air hits the front of the car, it goes through all the fins in the radiator and it steals waste heat from the coolant. And so the hot coolant from the engine that cooled the engine off goes in to the hot side of the radiator, gets cooled off by the incoming air when the vehicle's moving, and then that air, and there's usually a fan behind it, an assist fan if you're in stop and go traffic, but one way or the other, it gets sucked through or blown through or pushed through, and that takes the heat away from the engine coolant because the aluminum steals the heat from the coolant and then disperses it to the gas or air moving through it. 
Um, an intercooler for a turbocharged engine works the same way, whether it's water cooled or air cooled. The incoming air that's pressurized from the turbocharger goes through a fin device, usually made of aluminum, and what it's doing is it's cooling off the intake because when you put cold air into an engine and spray fuel into it, you get better coefficient of expansion or higher thermal efficiency because the temperature differential between the injected fuel mass and the expansion of hot mass pushing down with heat and pressure on the piston expands if you can get a bigger delta in temperature or a difference between the hot and cold. So I could go on and on for hours, but I don't have that much memory on my phone and you're probably gonna get bored, but aluminum's a really cool metal. It used to cost more than gold, if you can believe that. It's one of my favorite metals and that's why I smelt aluminum as a hobby. Um, even if I burn my finger and today I had a small accident, you know, that's the real world. Nothing's perfect. I'm not perfect. I mis make mistakes. Be careful. I wouldn't try this at home. I'm a scientist. I had done a ton of research before ever buying any of this equipment or trying it. I watched hundreds of hours of Big Stack D. I invested in safety gear and ceramic bricks. I've done everything I do it outdoors where there's ventilation outside my garage door. You have to be very careful. It's a thermal hazard. It takes hours for the furnace or the smelting furnace to cool off after you're done. So this isn't something you can do quickly. If you want to do it quickly at the benchtop scale, get an induction heater like that um, scientist. I forget his name. He's a scientist in, in Europe that it's it, an induction heater has a small coil of wire and it pumps current through water cooled copper tubes and they create a magnetic field that oscillates and, and it'll heat a crucible inside and it'll hold a few ounces. So if you're gonna smell precious metals like gold or silver or, or platinum and you're a jeweler or you're getting into that kind of hobby, get an induction smelting system that's bench top size. Um, two Auto on Amazon sells uh, 1300, 1500, 1800, 2000 watt electric smelting furnaces. You might try that too. I didn't because I don't want to blow out the electrical panel in my apartment. Um, if I was running it on my own home, if I lived in a single family home and I had a 200 amp panel and I could wire it to a high amperage 35 amp circuit or something like level two charger, then I might consider doing something like that. But I'm not gonna do an electric smelter. This little propane furnace that I showed you has 35 kilowatts or 35,000 watts of thermal performance. And it just use a regular barbecue propane tank. I have two, so when I run out of one, I, it doesn't kill my operation. Um, so I always keep them full rotated. So when one runs out, I switch to the other and then I refill the one that's empty. And so I always have a rolling inventory of propane to keep this thing operating. I only do this once every few months because it takes me that long to collect and dry the cans. I only use cans that have air dried pretty thoroughly because if there's liquid in the can, it's a bad thing. It can cause the aluminum to spatter. It can break your crucible. It can cause a serious accident, throw liquid metal at you. You only want to smelt dry cans if you're going to try smelting cans. With that, don't try this at home. This is not for children. This is only for adults. This is only for people that are comfortable working with propane heat sources. Absolutely don't repeat what you see me doing in these videos. Happy Friday nonetheless, and I hope you enjoyed the video. Cheers, guys. Thanks for watching. Consider hitting that subscribe button. I don't have that many viewing hours and I can't monetize my channel. I've never asked before, but hey, there's a first time for everything. Everything starts out small, right? Even Amazon just started as an idea. Now Jeff Bezos is one of the world's richest billionaires. He didn't start out a billionaire, but you can become one if you do the same thing he did and innovate some sector. Thanks again for watching. Have a wonderful Friday.